Welcome to Our Voice. I'm Rebecca Evans. And I'm Kim Peek. We have an amazing lineup for you this week, starting with walking a mile in the footsteps of Boise's Finest. And I had an intimate chat with Leslie Udwin. She is an award-winning filmmaker who is the producer and director of India's Daughter. We also have a doctor in the house today, Dr. Rob Hilvers. He specializes in caring for those who care for our community. And finally, we have Rocky Johnson, who is not just a great voice on the mic in our Acoustic Cafe, but she's also a voice and advocate for women, children, and vets. Among many others. So please, stay with us. As you know, we film here at CenturyLink Arena with great support from the Grove Hotel. And there's so many games going on here. There's basketball, there's hockey, and apparently there's doctoring. That's right. That's this week, Rebecca and I are going to test our skills at, well, at surgery. At surgery. That's yeah. scary. But here's the thing. You're going to have to stay tuned all through the show because we're going to do it at the end of the show. The end of the show. So stay tuned because coming up next, we have Kim interviewing our Boise's finest, Lieutenant Snyder and Officer Zimmer. Our guests today are part of the 1% that keep the 99% of us safe. We're joined today by Lieutenant Ted Snyder and Officer Chris Zimmer from the Boise Police Department. We have the opportunity to get a glimpse into their, into their life. We were dispatched to a call from a social worker that someone they've been working with has been having some issues lately. His wife called in, said that he had screwed all the doors and windows shut in the house and she'd been trapped inside for approximately two days and he wouldn't let her out. Better I called into the residence. The uh, she told me that she was yeah. able to unscrew the yeah, front, front door while he was uh, in another part of the house and he didn't know she did that. So and so then we had her run out the door to the officers that were waiting. I'll talk yeah, to her and, to and investigate what crimes we have and then we'll start to get her assistance either through our victim witness coordinators or if she needs further interview from detectives. So I'm going to go talk to the, uh, the, the wife right now and, and see what we have. So can we bring her back here with Belinda and then I'll move up with Charlie? So we could go through the back, that might be a better option. Um, but then I guess you'd have to get her over the fence or run off. Okay, all right. I'm gonna box in the suspect's truck in the driveway and then we're gonna use our, our PA system to hail him out and hopefully he'll come out peacefully to us. David, this is the Boise Police. We wanna speak with you. Come out of your residence with your hands up. We wanna speak with you and check on your welfare. So the way we left it, we, we attempted to contact the male at the residence. He refused to come out because there was no longer anybody else inside with him. There wasn't an exigent need to go in, force an issue, whether confrontation with him and us. We walked away, and so we'll come back another day, make those things happen. But the important thing was getting his wife out of the house and safe, and we were able to accomplish that um, with fortunately no, nobody getting hurt or no issues spiraling from that point. So Chris, that footage, is that a typical situation you run into? It is, yes. Uh, that was a domestic violence call um, and that's pretty typical for a shift. They all vary somewhat okay. depending on you know each specific situation, right. but yes. Right. Well we want our viewers to get to know a little bit about what it's like to be a police officer, kind of get into your life. So Ted, tell us, did you always want to be a police officer? <laughs> no, not really. I started out in life from the time I was probably about a freshman in high school thinking towards a, a career in accounting. Okay. So yeah, I aimed my sights towards that and uh, got my accounting degree from the University of Idaho and worked for about two and a half years in the accounting industry and thought, hmm, this isn't for me. And so I'd done a ride-along with a fellow officer that we went to church with and did two ride-alongs with him and I was hooked after that. I you thought, were hooked. I've got to do this. That's great. And how about you, Chris? Uh, no, not for me as well. I, I went to college to be a teacher. After okay. college, I started working with abused children and then quickly realized instead of being in um, the treatment side of things, I wanted to work in prevention and intervention and, and holding those accountable that, that did criminal acts instead. Okay, okay. And along with that, what's the re most rewarding part of your job? Uh, I think just when you go handle a call, you know, it's not a normal day for somebody if they're calling 911. And so when you go there and are able to resolve a situation, um, just seeing the relief on their face uh, when it's all done or them telling you that thank you 
Thank um, you. That, that's the best thing you can hear because uh, you never know what you prevent and I'm sure every day you know we're doing stuff that keeps things from happening but in those situations when you know you've you've changed something for the better that's there's nothing beats that. That's great that's great and what about you Ted? The same I mean like he said people don't call 911 because they're inviting you over for a coffee or for lunch you know so right. they're in some type of crisis usually when they call 911 so we show up and do the best we can to help so probably the greatest satisfaction is once in a while you get that feedback somebody says thank you they write you a letter and just knowing that you've helped somebody so knowing that you've done that at the end of each call that's the best satisfaction you that's get. the reward that's the reward so Chris if someone is interested in becoming a police officer how can they find out more about that then go to our website at police.cityofboise.org and find out information on there Great. Well, thank you both for being here with us today, giving us a glimpse into the life of a police officer. We appreciate it. Coming up on Our Voice, we have an interview with award-winning filmmaker Leslie Edwin. I recently had the incredible experience to sit down face-to-face -face and talk to award-winning filmmaker Leslie Edwin, who produced and directed the film India's Daughter. Let's take a look. We have the best culture. In our culture, there is no place for a woman. Brutal gang rape of a 23-year-old girl on her way home from a movie triggered an awakening that took many by surprise. According to the latest government figures, one woman is now raped in India every 20 minutes. The lady on the other hand we can say the girl or woman are more precious than a gem, than a diamond. If you put your diamond on the street, certainly the dog will take it out. You can't stop. it. <laughs> Leslie, I want to thank you so much for being here. I, thank you so much for having me on here. I am just honored, number one, to meet you. I have to, I have to tell you, uh, I've watched clips of this film, and it is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see what's going on. So I, I want to kind of just take you back to 2012. When news hit about this atrocity, what was your initial reaction when you heard about the story? Well, Rebecca, I guess my stomach turned um, collectively with the whole world at the brutality, um, the hate-filled, heinous details of this rape. But, to be honest, I've heard it before. We all have. Um, there was nothing particularly, sadly, remarkable about the rape itself. What was extraordinary 
was the response to the rape, what followed in the ensuing days and indeed weeks, um, because the entire country seemed to mobilize. There was this extraordinary outpouring of anger and passion and commitment to change, mm -hmm. unprecedented numbers, and there were men and women, and it was so inspiring. I was all struck, you know, and, and I'd never seen such a passionate commitment from civil society for change, to end rape culture um, and seek justice for women and girls though I am full of optimism. Right. I know we're going to change the world, but we have to. We have you no further down to go. in the darkness. I mean, that's really, I think when people try to find healing, even your own personal experience with rape, I think this gives it meaning. Yes. And it's no coincidence, actually, Rebecca, that the mechanism that, that does that with film and why film is the most powerful tool for change that there is, is because it's empathetic as a medium. And I feel like you have captured this moment in time, India's daughter, you've put her in a time capsule, you've given her life to continue on and a voice to continue on so that it will not be forgotten. I think that is another key component. This is where we've been, we have to acknowledge that. And I wanna, I wanna thank you for your work. I, I am honored to meet you and, and to be part of this journey in a very small way and to have this time to interview you and, you and get to know you. Rebecca, it's really important for me to say, I wanna thank you for your work. We are all doing this together. Um, Peggy Goldwyn with her Family of Women Film Festival, Idaho University who are putting on these films. Um, you know, your fantastic program it's not a small thing in comparison. It's just we all do, we, we are grappling with an idea whose time has come. And particularly for women and girls, the time has come because we are at the bottom of the heap of the world's real meaningful focus. The LGBT community is far, far, far more advanced than we are. Um, we're the last of, right. you know, the, the bastion of um, uh, abuse of, of human rights. Right. And we, are all doing it together and I am in awe of you and what you do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so really, it's, there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Yeah. We must all do this together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for being on, on the show. And I'm going to follow you. I'd like to follow up with you and see what further changes and how we can further be of support with your, um, with your journey. I'm just, I'm so excited to see what's going to unfold and continue to unfold for you with India's daughter. And thank you for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. So part of our voice is to be a powerful tool, a powerful vessel in the community to make a difference. And having the opportunity to interview filmmaker, award-winning filmmaker, Leslie Udwin, really gives us a chance to be a voice to share a powerful story that happened in 2012. And really, this story should not be forgotten. I wanna thank you, the viewer, for watching. Get involved, be part of the change, be part of the education that needs to happen and help create empathy. Rebecca, that had to be an incredible experience. What was one of your takeaways? You know, honestly, there were so many things to take away from Leslie, but I think the cultural change that needs to happen with the mindset of how women are viewed around the world, and I think it starts at a young age, and we could do something about that. So if you want more information, you can go to indiasdaughter.com, and the full interview is also available on our YouTube channel at Our Voice Idaho. Great. Coming up next, we have one of the finest doctors around. Dr. Hilvers joins us next. If you've ever needed a specialist when it comes to medicine, there are plenty of options from ophthalmologists to ophthalmologists to orthopedic surgeons, but we found a doctor here in the Valley that specializes in a niche group. Here with us today is Dr. Rob Hilvers. We're so excited to have you for on the me. set. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So I want to start off and just ask you this question. Did you know you always wanted to be a doctor? No. I decided later in college, I thought I was going to work for NASA, I thought about going into medicine. I got injured in college playing ball and I had surgery and ended up becoming friends with my orthopedic surgeon when I was in college in New York who convinced me to try to think about medicine over the years and finally my junior summer working with him I decided to sit really late for the medical school entry exam and um, did well and um, so it was a late decision, it was a good decision. So from that time, you're at that moment 
to this moment, you now have this niche community that you're really serving, and these are first responders. So tell us a little bit. I, I'm just curious, how did that even come about? Because no one else is really doing this. Yeah, so I started off, I really wanted to go into family medicine. I wanted the ability to do international medicine and be able to treat really as much as I could treat. Um, and uh, along the way, I was very fortunate to get a job working in the emergency room in St. Luke's, uh, which has been wonderful. About 2004, I also got a call from Boise Fire asking if I would be willing to take care of their Boise, the special operations dive team. And so it was 30 members. We did it in September. It was great. We put together a quick makeshift clinic. Um, the next year, they said, hey, would you also be willing to see our hazardous materials team? So it went from 30 to 60. And then the following year, they also said, hey, what about our high angle rescue team and our guys over 50? And that next year, Meridian Fire had called and said, hey, would you be willing to see our recruits? And it's different for first responders because you're dealing with physical therapy issues. These guys get injured differently on the job than your average desk jock, right? But there's also a cardiac side so of it too that they're a little more at risk. Is if that If I correct? were to say there were probably three number of things that we take care of. Number one is cardiovascular risks. Uh, number two would be orthopedic musculoskeletal injuries and probably behavioral health. But when you look at just cardiac disease among firefighters and police officers, so studies have shown that you know firefighters have about a fourfold increased risk of online cardiac death. Police officers almost twofold increased wow. risk. And so when you think of an average 45 year old, you think three in the morning alarm goes off, right? So you get the sympathetic heart rate, blood pressures through the roof. You haven't even got out of bed yet, right? Your heart rate's already up. Right. So then you put these turnouts on, your core temperatures start to rise, and then you throw severe physical exertion into the mix. And then I always say you throw pride into there, right? These guys are very passionate about what they do. They're there to protect. And so Average firefighter is not going to stop when they have some chest pain, and so they will often right. work They're through the that. They're the warriors. They're the right. warriors. And I would say the same thing with law enforcement. We, I was involved with 2008 when we had that bench fire, and I was in the emergency room that night, and we had seven Boise police officers show up in the emergency room with inhalational exposures. They were the, truly the first responders at that fire, so they also wow. have those risks. And you've been written up in some magazines regarding this care because no one else is really doing this, so tell me a little bit about that as well. Well, Chief Michael Masterson, who was uh, the police chief, uh, recently retired, wrote an article about a uh, cardiac study that we have ongoing with St. Alphonsus right now, um, and it got picked up nationally, and so we were getting calls from a lot of East Coast departments about, so what is the program, what is this wellness program that you have? And so I got a call from the chief editor in the Massachusetts about writing an article wow. about our program. So it was yeah, published uh, August of 2014. Also, um, I want to know, you know, you worked in the ER for a little bit of time. Is there a life lesson that you learned working in the ER? Yeah, so uh, as a patient. So I, uh, as a patient, four, okay. Four years ago, I had, uh, I came off a of night shifts doing ER work and I had had a terrible road bike accident. I hit the pavement at 30 miles an hour, my fault. Uh, and I had broke my severe femur fracture. I had broke my, my femur in really six different places and spent the entire night in the OR. I woke up with a plate and 13 screws in my femur. I dropped 60% of my blood overnight. Yeah, so that, I mean, and did that change how you practice medicine now? It does. Yeah. I, I mean, you, it makes you very um, humbled. Yeah. You know, and I, I think you have a much better perspective on people with the concerns of disability, the concerns of pain, the concerns of losing your job. If people want to get a hold of you, any capacity, how can they do that? So easiest way is through the website, so www.er-hc.org. Okay, well again, thank you so much. You have the website on the screen. And coming up next on Our Voice is Rocky Johnson, who is a great voice in the community, but she's also a great advocate. You're going to want to stay with us. Welcome back to Our Voice. Today we have one of the Treasure Valley's most well-known voices, not only for her vocals, but also for her advocacy here in our Acoustic Cafe. Welcome, Rocky Johnson. Thank you, Kim. Thanks we're, for having me. Yes, we're so glad to have you. And so just to get our viewers to know a little bit about you, tell us a little bit about what inspired you as a musician, as a vocalist. Was it a certain artist, or what was it? Well, there weren't a lot of women in rock and roll when I was small, and mm -hmm. um, I was inspired by you know, Gracie Slick and Janis Joplin and, and strong women like Tina Turner that hit the stage and really wowed the people. I know just as important to you, if not more important than your music, is your advocacy work. Tell us a little bit about that, a cause near and dear to your heart and what you're doing right now. Well, as a survivor myself of child abuse and, and domestic abuse, sure. um, I, I really feel it's very important to give back to the community and I've always strived to do so with events, fundraisers, and especially with raising consciousness here in the Valley so that uh, women are, are able to understand and that they do not have to stay in a situation that's untenable. 
Okay, that's great. And I know that you wanted to share a hotline um, with our viewers in case anybody's in that situation right now. I do. Yes, the hotline for the WC is 208-343-7025. And the 1-800 number is 1-800-377-3529. And it's on your screen. And th what I would like to really impress upon your guests today is that if your friends and family, are, you're reaching out to them and you're not able to communicate your situation and you really know that you need help and you need to find a safe place, call this number. Our viewers need to know that you can reach out and get help and there's counseling for you so that you realize that if you're in a situation where you, your money's being controlled or your friends are being controlled or what you wear is being controlled, this leads to other things. It's not right to be controlled in such a way, and there is a way to move forward out of that. I know, Rocky, that your music is important to you to also further this awareness. So share with us a song that you're going to sing for us today and why you chose that. This song is called Luca. It's written by Suzanne Vega, and it's from the vantage point of a child who's being abused. And this song really touched me because I was young when it first came out and it was about a subject that people did not discuss. Right. It was not normal to talk about child abuse and domestic abuse. And I think it's important that we do so. And when we speak loudly, sing about it, talk about it, it we're able to move out of the darkness of that abuse and into the light of day where no, that abuse can no longer occur. Well said, let's hear Rocky Johnson sing Luca. second floor I live upstairs in you yes I think you've seen me before if you hear something late at night some kind of double some kind of fight just don't ask me what it was just don't ask me It's cause I'm clumsy I try not to talk too loud Maybe it's because I'm crazy And I try not to act too proud They only hit until you cry After that, you don't ask why You just don't argue I think you've seen me before If you hear something late at night Some kind of trouble, some kind of 
fight Just don't ask me what it was Just don't ask me what it was Just don't ask me what it was They only it until you cry And I do that You don't ask why You just don't argue anymore You just don't argue Rocky, that was an incredible song. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you for having me sing it. So um, to wrap up here, what would you say has been one of the, the biggest life lessons or defining moments you've had as you've gone forward with your music as a rock star and also, on the other hand, been a real advocate for, for abuse in our society? Well, um, I, I was uh, put together an event called the Celebration of Women in the Arts, which I hosted for over 20 years. Um, and it... I got together with nine women here in town that are still together to this day, well actually 25 years later, come to think of it, <laughs> and we performed as a benefit for the WCA, and we're called the Divas of Boise, and we advocated for women's issues as well, and the empowerment of women. First few years of that, I decided it was important for me to speak to my experiences as a survivor. Wow. And so I stood on stage and talked about it, and I was very pointed and personal. Rocky, thank you so much for joining us. Can you just, um, in the uh, last seconds we have together, just share with us how people can find out more about your music and where you're playing next? Well, I perform at Hump and Hannah's downtown in, Boise, in downtown Boise at 621 Main. I'm there Wednesday, Fridays, and Saturdays. Oh, okay. And we host all kinds of great events, so uh, always check out our Facebook page and our website at humpandhannahs.com. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Stay with us. And next, we have that peek for you that we promised with Dr. Hilvers, where he's teaching Rebecca and I something about surgery. I guess we're prepped. As promised, Dr. Hilvers has arrived to do some surgery, right? So yes. you're going to train me a little bit on this procedure? Absolutely. So what's the prognosis? We have a patient. Yeah, so Rebecca, we've got a 28-year-old hockey player comes in with a so little bit. So we don't need yeah, so we don't need that no. hockey player. So okay. Comes in with a couple injuries. You can see he's got a, a dislocated uh, wishbone. Oh, do I have any wood? No. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Go ahead. And he comes in with a leg injury. Okay, and looks like a Charlie horse to me. So what do we do? So we can do surgery. Okay. So, surgery. Okay. Yeah. So if you're going to do surgery, you're going to need surgical equipment. Okay. So you're going to need a sterile fork. Sterile fork. And a sterile butter knife. And a sterile butter knife. Okay, yes. great. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I know. I found these, so. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah so those, what do these do? Oh! All right, I think you killed them. So maybe next time we just prescribe stretches. Thank you so much for watching Our Voice, and we want you to be part of our community at Our Voice Idaho. And join our conversations on our Facebook page. Because your voice matters. Here on Our Voice. <laughs>